Hello, everybody out there in SEBA land. Uh, I know uh, we wish we were all together, um, nursing uh, lunchtime hangovers right now with all the celebrating for new books, but we are all at home. So many of you may, might still actually be hungover. I don't know what you do in the privacy of your own home. Um, but I want to welcome you to this uh, 1 p.m. event. We are talking with some writers with some new books, some new writers uh, whose names you may not know and uh, a couple of writers that you are all very familiar with. My name is Wiley Cash. I am a novelist living uh, in North Carolina, coming to you from the coast here in Wilmington. I'm also the host of SEBA's Reader Meet Writer, which is an evening event that happens, uh, and also on Saturdays, uh, several times a week, where we are introducing your readers to writers they would normally be meeting in your store. So Thank you for bringing writer. Thank you for bringing readers to those events. I'm really enjoying them. I think uh, readers are as well. So please continue to tune in, and continue to steer your readers toward us. I'm also the proud recipient of last year's Pat Conroy Legacy Award, and I am the writer in residence at the University of North Carolina Asheville. So today we're going to talk with uh, with with four writers who have uh, new books out or, or books reissued or new things, exciting things going on. But perhaps you have a question for one of our writers during today's event. And if you do, I want to encourage you to go to the Q&A portion of your screen there. Uh, the chat is disabled as far as I know, but you can go into the Q&A and, and type your question for one of our four authors. And um, when you do, make sure you see your name and uh, your home bookstore, the bookstore you are with. Uh, the bookstore you work for, the bookstore you own, because we want to give shout outs to everyone we can. Um, and we want to hear from you and know exactly who we're, who, who we're hearing from. So at the end of the show, I will um, ask your questions of these authors. But we have some great authors today, and uh, they have a couple of things in common. Um, they are all uh, proud representatives of the regions uh, that they call home. And they are also authors who are mentees and mentors people who have benefited and continue to benefit others uh, in this great Southern literary tradition that has been created for us in which we are all, all of us, readers, booksellers, and authors alike, uh, dedicated to fostering and to keeping going. So I thought what I would do uh, at the top of the show is introduce them one by one and then um, ask whoever I'm introducing if they would tell us just a little bit about their experience um, having been mentored by a writer who came before them, and now their role in, in doing the same with others. So we'll start with a writer that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of before uh, or any of her books, Lee Smith. She was born in the small coal mining town of Grundy, Virginia, and she began writing stories at the age of nine and selling them for a nickel apiece. Since then, she's written 17 works of fiction and received many awards, including the North Carolina Award for Literature and an Academy Award in Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She lives in Hillsborough, North Carolina with her husband, the writer Hal Prather, and her novella, The Blue, Martin, the Blue Marlin, uh, was just released earlier this year. So Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Would you mind talking a little bit at the top of the show about um, mentors you've had and, and, and your role as a mentee? You've mentored countless writers, and we're going to hear uh, about that today from some other folks. But would you tell us about writers that have kind of taken you under their wing? I think Lee's muted. Lee, you're muted again. There you go. Now you're unmuted. Can you hear me? I can okay. now. Okay, well, I, I'm awfully glad to uh, to speak on this topic because I feel like I was so incredibly lucky as a young person having picked Holland's College in Roanoke, Virginia, just because my mother thought I might get a husband there. <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to be a writer. I did nothing but read and write always. But I never even thought that, it, you know, I mean, that there would be a class in. I mean, I did not go there for the writing. And luckily, the Hol the Hollands had just acquired a person who would become a very famous writing teacher and also publisher, as well as critic, Lewis Rubin, Lewis D. Rubin Jr., who kind of invented Southern literature and also creative writing on a graduate level. 
I think Highlands had only one of one of there was a there was a graduate writing course at um, Stanford, I think, and one at um, in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins that Lewis had started before he came to Holland. And so he was all about actually teaching creative writing, which was completely frowned upon by many scholars and thought that had no, no part, should have no part in the university. So anyway, I was so lucky to be in his class from the time I was a freshman on and we had graduate students in our classes we had people from freshman sophomore you know a certain number of people were only were interested in writing and we were in there we were in there with graduate students often with other uh, professors with professors who had written something and so this was a really serious course it met in lewis's basement in his den you could have a beer and smoke a cigarette and it would last for three hours. We never had a writing prompt. He said, if you don't have something to say, I don't want you in here. So, you know, you were in there and we were reading, of course, great stuff all the time uh, in our literature classes. But he was absolutely wonderful because he listened to us like, and he read our work like it deserved to be taken seriously. And he took it so seriously. And so we did too. And we took each other's work so seriously. If you had not read something that another person had written, you were kicked out of the class for good. So, um, and it was, you know, and it was just a really, really serious look at writing and reading of our work. And it meant everything, everything. Um, Annie Dillard was my roommate at the time. She was in the class too. And we had a number of, you know, people who would go on to write all kinds of other things. But so Lewis was very serious and that really worked. And he was very respectful of us. And no one was ever made fun of or not listened to. And then it's so different from the atmosphere I have seen in some writing workshops that I visited I won't say where, <laughs> but you know, there, there are places that are, that are quite different from that. On the other hand, he also uh, knew how to have a good time. I mean, he would be in his office. He's always in his office smoking his guitar and cracking jokes. And, you know, he had a band named the Hambones that was like a barbershop quartet. So the English majors had a band too, which was the Virginia Wolves. And we had, Go Go Girls, of which I was one and Annie was one, and a girl from Nashville named Baby Joe was another, and we all had go go names and white boots. So there was a uh, there was an atmosphere that literature, that writing was fun. And it was for everybody. You didn't have to put on airs, um, you know. And it was so he was my model. He was always my model, and because he was so accessible to us. I think I have uh, tried to be accessible to young writers I've been lucky enough to run into and mainly to take them very seriously because, you know, you are smarter right now, like Heather and Annette, you are sure. smarter than we are. You are smarter than you'll ever be again, too. And so you will do your best work. You may do it right now. And, and the it's things very, that you're saying, very important to understand that. And the things that you're saying about Lewis, I think, you know, maybe aside from, you know, playing the guitar and, and, and singing in a barbershop quartet, I think many people would say about you, I certainly would. I feel like you've always been somebody who's been incredibly accessible to people who are uh, influenced by you and, and trying to, to do the things that, that you are doing and, and have done so well. And I know that one of those writers that you have played a particular role in fostering their development, not only as a writer, but also as a representative of a place and a consciousness of a place is Silas House. So I wanna introduce Silas now. Silas is the New York Times bestselling author of numerous works. His writing has appeared frequently in the New York Times and he's been published in Time, Newsday, Garden and Gun, all over the place. He's the winner of multiple national and literary awards and he teaches at Berea College and in the Spalding University School of Writing. His three novels, Clay's Quilt, A Parchment of Leaves, and The Cold Tattoo, have all been recently reissued. So, Silas, would you, um, at, at the top of the show here, spend a few moments and tell us about a, a relationship you've had or a mentoring experience that's really meant a lot to you? 
Uh, yes, I'm so glad to be able to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> Lee Smith was mentoring me before I ever met her because when I was in ninth grade, I read Black Mountain Breakdown and it was the first time that I had ever seen my own people in a book. You know, they were eating the kinds of food my family ate. Mm -hmm. They were going to the swimming pool at the breaks, which is where we went to a swimming pool. You know, I mean, the way they talked, everything, it was just, just that moment of, of the world shifting to see your own people on the page and, and being treated seriously. Um, and so, um, Years later, I heard that Lee was doing a reading uh, pretty near me over in Hazard, Kentucky, and I went and stood in a big long line, and I was one of those people that waited at the end of the line, so I would have plenty of time to talk. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when I told Lee my name so she could sign the book, she, she said that she had recently read a short story by someone named Silas. And I said, well, that was me. It was my first published short story. And so right away, she said, well, you have to go and, and study at the Appalachian Writers Workshop. And I, I, want, to, I want to read your book. I, mean, I had just met her. <laughs> and, and she offered to read my novel. And she read it right away. And she gave me a very generous and very honest feedback. And that was, I guess, about 20 two years ago. And she has never stopped doing that since. I've now published my sixth novel and she was just as behind me on that sixth novel. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, when people talk about m mentors and things of that nature in the publishing world, a lot of times they think that means that they make connections for you or, or things like that. And that is sometimes true. But I think what has been the most important thing to me is just being validated. You know, having somebody to cheer me on the way Lee has. I mean, you just can't ask for a better person to do that. And I'm certainly not alone um, in this. I mean, there's a whole, I feel like that I am, I sort of have classmates who were also mentored by Lee. And when we get together, we have this common bond. And, you know, Lee is our literary mother. And um, so I talk about her everywhere I go in that way. Yay! <laughs> tell people that and <clears throat> shortly before my first book was published I mean I was country come to town I guess I still am in a way but um, I, I was terrified of going out on the road I was so afraid that I would open my mouth to speak and the whole room would get up and leave you know where everybody would start laughing and Lee uh, took me on a walk we were at a writing workshop together and she said, when you go on this book tour, what you need to do is just be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. And if they don't like it, then that's just too bad. And that was my philosophy from there on. And, um, and ever since then, I've felt comfortable, more comfortable in, in, in front of an audience. And it just released me, you know. And Lee also was responsible for other mentors of mine. Um, she introduced me to the work of Larry Brown. And so I, I met him not long after um, when I became an Algonquin author, we were put on a book tour together and he immediately took me under his wing and uh, we just had a, such a connection. And uh, we had a long uh, letter correspondence that's just a treasure, one of my treasures that I keep with me always. Um, and then Brad Watson was another mentor of mine who recently passed away, um, who I studied with at, uh, at the Spalding School of Writing. Um, so Lee and Larry and Brad, Connie Mae Fowler was a mentor of mine. And Dorothy Allison has, has been somebody from early on who, who just let me know that she liked what I was doing. And having that stamp of approval for, from somebody who was, who, was, who was one person that I was emulating. You know, I look back now at my first novel and I see how much of Lee Smith and Dorothy Allison and Larry Brown. <laughs> They're all over that book. You know, um, I guess uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery, right? Um, <laughs> but I, I was, I, they were writing the books that I wanted to write. And so when I sat down to write the book I wanted to read, they're there, you know, they're, they're, they're still there in my writing. Um, 
So I could I could feel this whole hour was just talk, was singing Lee Smith's praises. I just I don't know how she does what she does because she is she helps so many people, and um, and I just love you so much, Lee. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I just love you so much. You can't imagine. But you know, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And it's a privilege to get to see new work and to work with young people and to think that you're part of a chain, yeah. you know, and that you're helping something that's going to continue, that's going to go on beyond you, after you. And it's a great pleasure. It's a great privilege. And that's the other thing Lee always told me, you know, I would say, I don't know how to thank you. And she would say, well, you can thank me by helping some other writer along the way. Mm -hmm. I've always tried to do that. And, and I like what you said, Silas, about, you know, it's not always about connections or making a connection for someone. Sometimes it's just about acknowledgement. And speaking from personal experience, you know, when my first book came out, uh, we had just moved back to North Carolina, you know, I'm in, nobody and i and lee in an interview i read in a print magazine somewhere mentioned my first book and i remember the feeling of knowing that my book had been in lee smith's mouth or mind or she had spoken those words in an interview and it felt like my ears got hot my heart started racing and silas i felt the same way the first time i met you at the aba luncheon um, in new york several years ago you know we're in this huge room of 500 booksellers and authors and I knew right where you were you were like the hot center of my universe and I was like kind of on edge because you were such a big deal to me when I was first starting out I mean we're relatively the same age but you started out so much earlier than I did and you came up and talked to me and uh that was a big deal you know and and sometimes and you know we've gotten to be buddies since then but sometimes things like that just make all the difference and and so, so I want to go, go now to someone that Silas has, has spent some time talking to. Uh, Annette Sanuk Clapsaddle uh, is an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Her work, Going to Water, won the Morning Star Award for Creative Writing from the Native American Literature Symposium. And it was a finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. She is co-editor of the Journal of Cherokee Studies, and she serves on the Board of Trustees for the North Carolina Writers Network. And her new novel, is even as we breathe. Annette, thanks for joining us. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your experience with mentors and your, the, 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 the responsibility you may feel now, especially working with young people as you do? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And at, while we're talking about working with young people, if I mute, it's because the bell is about to ring in the school <laughs> that I'm teaching in today. So I'll try to spare you from that. Um, Yes, so I, I think I'll go back um, in in my experience um, with mentors and start with Silas. Silas is my, I consider him my current mentor. He was the editor of Even As We Breathe. And I met Silas when we were working um, with some young folks in our school and another school in New York and had partnered with some authors, including Wiley. Um, to work with our students um, in a writing workshop and then to do some readings at our school. And then I had the um, great fortune of attending Hindman Settlement School um, for the Appalachian Writers Workshop. And so Silas and I were able to talk more there and immediately one of the most humble and talented men I've ever met in my life um, and just I just felt um, wholly supported to be able to have conversations <laughs> it's like it's almost like you're bleeping out what <laughs> I should have timed that better right <laughs> it's perfect brought us, brought us all back time to go to we're getting, getting our trays and backpacks and going to the yeah. cafeteria <laughs> Um, but it, to be able to sit down with Silas in a casual atmosphere um, like at Heinemann and just talk about how we wanted to represent um, this region was really important to me. Um, I, there's a lot of trepidation um, in terms of how do I talk about my specific culture, which, you know, from Cherokee, North Carolina, there's nobody else writing about it. Um, how do I do that? and still um, ah. 
and still <laughs> um, and still convey a narrative that matters. And and Silas is a master of that. So um, so I just am so thankful that I can call him a friend. And he. And we have the same kind of work habits too, which I really appreciate. We, we like our deadlines and we like our schedules and that, that's helpful as well. Um, but go, and going back, um, I remember one of the, uh, the first manuscript I wrote, I really started writing it in college and I was fortunate, fortunate enough to have a family friend, Billy Letts, who's from Oklahoma, wrote Where the Heart Is. And I, I was starstruck by Billy because I kind of knew her and she had so much uh, success with her first book. And um, she came to our local bookstore and I, and I kind of laughed when Silas said he waited at the end of the line for Lee. I did the same thing for Billy Letts. I knew if I'm at the end of the line, then she can't go anywhere. <laughs> go anywhere. And um, I, I had, um, a copy of my manuscript with me and I was talking to her and she asked to see it and she took it um, and read it and when she called me she talked through every I swear it felt like every page and at the end of that conversation I was in absolute tears <laughs> because she gave me honest feedback and <laughs> And I was like, I was embarrassed and excited and all of those things, but I knew where to go because she was honest with me. And I will never forget how appreciative I was because she's a, she was a kind woman, but um, she knew that I was serious about what I wanted to do. And she gave me the gift of being honest um, about the feedback on my first manuscript. So I just will never forget that. And then I would say, I have to say um, my other mentor, um, that I am so grateful to know um, is Charles Frazier and he was working on 13 moons in Cherokee um, <clears throat> when I met him I was working in our chief's office and um, I, I, re I actually met him and his wife as I was opening books for him to sign at our museum and just started talking to him there and he um, has read multiple drafts of my manuscripts and we'll sit down and again, go through, uh, you know, chapter by chapter, um, his thoughts on, on the uh, drafts of those manuscripts. His wife um, is also a very good friend and I call when I need advice about the business in general and how things work and, and decisions that have to be made. Um, and they're always checking in on me. And so I, I feel like I have just been crazy lucky to have a, a family of writers like that in my life. That's wonderful. And speaking of um, lines of descent and, and feedback on manuscripts, our, our next writer is someone who, who obviously got, uh, if not great feedback on a manuscript, then definitely great news on a manuscript. Uh, Heather Friese's fiction and essays and poetry have appeared in numerous publications, uh, earning her notable mention in the Pushcart Prize Anthology and Best American Essays. Um, she writes about the coast of North Carolina, uh, but she currently writes, edits, and wrangles three small children in Raleigh, North Carolina. And her new novel, which won the Lee Smith Prize from Blair, is called The Baddest Girl on the Planet. So Heather, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about mentors you've had and some mentoring experiences you may have, um, have had with others? Yeah, sure. I am so excited to be here with all of you. Um, I think I'll start talking about my my sort of most important mentor in um, grad school, which was Joan Connor, who I worked with at Ohio University. And sort of a lot of things that everyone has been saying have um, really resonated here because um, like Joan is like, super serious about our work and our writing, but also, so connecting with that, but also connecting on just like a human basis. Like when I first started, like I grew up in um, Southeastern kind of rural Appalachian, Ohio. and um, when I first kind of started going to conferences and um, started to take, you know, creative writing seriously, um, I sort of had the impression that you had to be kind of snotty and wear a beret and a scarf and like talk about, you know, highfalutin, highfalutin authors that I hadn't even read yet. And so um, when I met Joan, who was just so like kind and funny and sweet and down to earth and would, would um, 
talk about our Yorkies and, you know, try on clothes in the thrift stores and, um, you know, have mimosas together. It's just like sort of um, that sense of connection that you can sort of be who you are as a person and still be a serious writer um, was hugely important. So, and of course her impact on my work was also massively important, but um, that human connection also was just um, something really valuable to me that has carried me through. And then um, just for a second, like I think, um, kind of a mentor can be important and valuable to you I mean, if you haven't had like a long sustained relationship with them because um, I just want to talk for a second about Janet Peary who was a visiting writer um, during my second graduate school in West Virginia. Um, so she came in just as a, as a visiting author and um, you know we worked with her and workshopped stories and chapters and um, she just really connected with, um, it was actually ended up being a chapter out of this book and um, like she just liked it and her, her daughter had read it and said, hi hey, mom, have you read this this yet? Um, it's like something that she like her daughter enjoyed, like she thought that people would like it. And Janet was just um, so encouraging to me. And she said, you know, she said, this is gonna be published. And I said, look, you don't know, like you think, you know, you're trying to get your footing and um, hope that you're writing something that's gonna get published. But um, just sort of that confidence that she had in the story and the character and in me as a writer, um, it honestly carried me through a whole lot of the submissions process because um, you know you get rejection after rejection and like I would think back and I would say well Janet Peary had this like this unshakable confidence like she said this is going to rise at the top like you know get it out there and so I would just keep doing it um, so like that was something that was really important and then if I can just circle around to Lee Smith for a minute if she was Silas's literary mother I feel like she's maybe my literary fairy godmother <laughs> um, I discovered Lee Smith in probably, I don't know, 2003 maybe with The Last Girls. And um, for a lot of the same reasons that my mentorship with Joan resonated with me, that book and Lee's voice um, just kind of captured me and I fell in love with it like because it, it was sort of this blend, again, of, um, you know, it's just, it's just literature. This is like someone who crafted this carefully and thoughtfully and the detail and the description and the setting, the like the capturing of the place and the voice was just uh, magical to me, but it was funny and it was light enough that I, I just wanted to keep reading and I connected with the characters and it was, um, I just fell in love with it. And from that point on, like when anyone would ask me who's, you know, whose lineage do you see yourself writing in? Like, where would you place yourself? I would say Lee Smith. And I would like read the rest of her books, fell in love with Fair and Tender Ladies, like that became my favorite book, still my favorite book of all time. Um, and then I heard Lee Smith speak at my very first AWP, I think it was 2005, maybe in Atlanta, and she was the keynote speaker. And um, she said something along the lines, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right, but she said something along the lines of like, you can only write what you can write. And again, I thought that just gave me so much freedom to be able to um, write in a voice that was authentic to me and be able to write stuff that, you know, isn't necessarily snotty and highfalutin that is like, um, can be fun and can be um, funny, but also, you know, carefully crafted and with, you know, definite care and thought to the, to the process. But you would connect to it like that. And it's just sort of this um, kind of magical um, happening that I would submit my book to the, the Lee Smith Novel Prize and um, it would win. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, can you tell us a little bit about your novel? Uh, speaking of characters that have a lot going on, you said that a few minutes ago and just mm -hmm. kind of have a, a lot, of, a lot that, that pull you in. Can you tell us a little bit about your book, that you, that your new book out? Yeah, yeah. So The Baddest Girl on the Planet is a coming of age novel. So it's set on Hatteras Island. Like I, I grew up in Ohio, southeastern Ohio, but we would vacation every summer on Hatteras Island. Um, and it became this hugely important place to me. And I later um, lived there for a year or so. I'm trying to write um, like authentically about that place, which is, you know, super special and unique and interesting as a setting, both for like the, the natural beauty and the history and the um, kind of the magic of it all. But also it's this isolated literal sandbar in the middle of an ocean with this tiny little tight knit community um, that my character is growing up in. And so um, in the book, EV Austin is the main character and she gets this bad reputation. Um, so she becomes like the bad girl in her, this little tight island community. And so throughout the course of the book, she's learning to, to sort of navigate her way through that and um, come to terms with it and in the end sort of redefine and reclaim what it means to be a bad girl. And it's all um, 
sort of taking place in this this small tight knit community of uh, Hatteras Island. Great. And, like, the voice, Evie's voice, was just like that's what kept me working on this project because it was um, it was again it was fun like it was so much fun to write and it made me laugh and um, like it was just funny and bright and interesting that I just wanted to keep kind of keep going so that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> well, <laughs> speaking of. Um, characters and, and tight-knit communities, uh, perhaps feeling like outsiders because of forces outside of their control. And that, will you tell us a little bit about your, your new book? Sure. Uh, Even As We Breathe is also a coming-of-age novel um, with the main character. County is a 19-year-old Cherokee young man who goes to work at the Grove Park Inn and Resort one summer in 1942. But it's a very special summer because the Grove Park Inn is holding access diplomats as prisoners of war um, for a couple of months that summer. And so County goes to work there. He also gives a ride to a young woman named Essie from Cherokee who is also working there that summer. And while he's at the Grove Park, he is accused of being involved in the disappearance of a diplomat's daughter. And so he has to clear his name. Um, and he is also sorting out some uh, betrayal by friends and um, trying to decide where he falls uh, in his uh, family back home and, and what his responsibilities are back home and um, the mystery surrounding his own father's death um, just at the end of World War One. So it's a little bit of a mystery, a little bit of a, a different take on a, a love story. Um, and I, I really use the setting to turn up the heat on some questions about race and identity and social class and the labels we decide to give one another in certain times and then remove them in other times when it's convenient. So, um, so we have essentially two uh, works here where we have characters who are representative of place, but also find themselves kind of outsiders in that place. And before I go and make my brilliant um, segue, uh, I want to encourage people to, if you have questions for our authors today, please type them into the Q&A. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to say the name of your bookstore during today's broadcast. It's going to be recorded and uh, posted um, all over the globe. Uh, so, so please uh, jump in with your questions for our authors uh, or just shout out the name of bookstores and I'll repeat them. I'm used to repeating things that I hear. Um, so... Lee, can we talk about your your novella? And you got to unmute yourself uh, before we before we jump into it. But you know, I I I I've, I love the book, but I love the book because your narrator never feels, and you're still you're still muted, Lee. But your narrate your narrator never feels. She's an insider, but she always <laughs> kind of feels like an outsider. And her father's an outsider of sorts because of his intellect. Her mother's an outsider of sorts because she's from outside the region. So can you talk a little bit about Blue Marlin and just kind of the, the situation our narrator finds herself in? Yeah, well, somebody wants to know if there are only two plots in literature. One is somebody takes a trip and the other one is a stranger comes to town. All right, in this one, it's number one, somebody takes a trip. And it's based on a very, this is a little novel based on a very real trip that I took with my parents in 1958. Um, they had been for a recent, various reasons separated for a year and both of them ill with different things and um, were trying to get back together. And daddy had a wonderful psychiatrist who prescribed not only lithium, for his illness, but also a geographical cure for the marriage. And so the geographical cure was the cure we were after. And, and the idea was to take a long, a big old long trip to somewhere where the whole family, would, which was only included me, age 12, uh, would all learn to be a family again and live together again and be back together and enjoy each other. So we all get in the big fishtail Buick and head for Key West. 
because my daddy had been there, stationed there in the Navy, and he'd always loved it. So there we go. They're not even speaking to each other all the way down. All they're doing is smoking big cigarettes. And so anyway, we get there and we check into a motel, which is still right in the middle of Key West. The motel is named Blue Marlin. And this little novel is the story of what happened at the Blue Marlin, which also turned out to be the place where the entire cast and crew of a movie were staying. The terrible movie Operation Petticoat, which was being filmed right there. And so our next door neighbor was Tony Curtis. And um, this pet my mother up considerably. Soon she was wearing a hibiscus in her hair, but you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like so many things you write, it's the, the novel, the novella is by turns um, devastating in its portraiture of a family in crisis yeah. while simultaneously making you laugh in the next line. And it's just this wonderful uh, representation of what life is like in, in these small communities. And then, you know, of course we go on the road uh, to, to Key West. And so, so Silas, you know, your last book, Southernmost, took us on the road. And um, my wife, Mallory, made me black out the camera. She had to pass through to get something and then had to pass back through. But the first time I ever heard that you had a new book coming out. Mallory was in Hillsborough doing some photos for, uh, for Lee for a project. And Mallory said, Lee was talking about Silas House has a new book coming out set in, set in Key West. I wonder what he would ever write about Key West. Um, so that book is out, but you also have a reissue of, of your, three, um, your three early novels. Can you tell us a little bit about the trilogy, maybe as a whole and the scope of it? Because you know, you're not so much writing about outsiders in a way you are, but these are people who are stamped by the region and are really in there, you know, drilling down on what it means to be from a place. So can you tell us a little bit about the trilogy? Well, these three books came out in very quick succession. They, uh, uh, from 2001 until 2004, these three books came out. And uh, so they do form, they can be read on their own, they stand on their own, but they're also a, a trilogy, the Appalachian Trilogy. Um, and so when you put all three of them together, it covers about 170 years in, in, in this family's, uh, in the Sizemore Sullivan family. So it's kind of a family saga. Um, I think it's a lot about, um, when I boil it down, I think it's about the profound connection between place and people and how we can't disconnect ourselves from our places, uh, how that's in just ingrained in us and it's imprinted on us. Um, um, it's also about creating family for yourself and also uh, the complexity of blood family. And another thing that I keep thinking about is it's about being wild at heart. It's about people who are just, um, they're just untamable people and they do everything in this big way. And I think that is really based on my family. We, you know, in my family, people uh, didn't do anything quietly or in a small way. You know, you worshiped really all the way, you loved all the way, you hated all the way, you fought all the way, you don't do anything halfway. And so that's what these characters do. So they're a lot of fun to write for that reason. Um, but if you read them in order, it's A Parchment of Leaves, The Cold Tattoo, and Clay's Quilt, although they weren't published in that order because I didn't know it was a trilogy until I uh, wrote the last book, I guess. The last book that was published made, made them the real trilogy, connected them all. So um, I love the idea of having like, you know, almost a thousand pages on this one family and people can dive into that if they want to, or they can just take it 300 pages at a time. <laughs> well, Silas, I want to ask you, we're, we're, get, we're getting some questions, and I want to, I want to ask this first one of you. Um, Kelly Justice, who, who is uh, at Fountain Bookstore, I'm sure a lot of you, most of you know Kelly up there in Richmond. Silas, I want to ask you, Kelly asked, what has your experience been like working with Southern publishers and editors? You know, you've been with Algonquin, Blair. Do you feel like having that, that, 
that 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 publishing background being a re, being regional perceiving has that influenced you, how you feel like your books have come out and been launched and been packaged and been showcased um yes i mean i think the main thing is that there's a there's a shorthand there's an understanding you know and i mean one of my publishers is in uh, uh new york city and one's in boston and then Algonquin is based in Chapel Hill, Blair in, in Winston-Salem, right? So I guess that's the main thing that comes to mind to me is there's just a, I don't mean to be provincial, but there's just an ease of conversation and it's, it's, it's an immediate sort of familiarity that, that isn't replicated as much. I think the other thing is, um, I've been able to get to just to get to know the Southern authors um, more deeply, somewhat because of things like SEBA, you know, um, mm -hmm. so it would be wonderful if we were all together, of course. Um, and I know we, we can't be, and this is a, a close second, but I formed such <clears throat> long lasting relationships because of SEBA. Um, getting to know not only my uh, not only booksellers who i've come to count as real friends but also people in my in my publishing house you know because you get to hang out at during things like c but um so yeah i guess just an uh, and i don't mean to say anything bad about the new york or boston publishers they've been wonderful to me but it is there's a familiarity and an ease and um a connection that there's just something that connects us as, as Southerners. And Lee, what about you? You've been without, with Algonquin and, and Blair and, and, but also other publishers. Do you feel positioned with the Southern publisher? Like, 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 uh, like, like uh, Silas said, there's a shorthand of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. I really do. Yes. I, I was I published a lot of books with New York publishers and I had a, a for a long time, a wonderful editor at Putnam, Faith Sale, who was somebody who could bridge any culture gap because she was she was kind of just like us. I mean, she was just really warm, really outgoing. She wasn't, she just couldn't, she'll stay up all night talking to you about your family or just whatever, you know, and she was that kind of person. And so I felt very comfortable um, with her, with Putnam. But I would get these weird questions, you know, from Putnam. I mean, I remember saying that somebody had a, a uh what was it oh i had a toboggan you know that you put on your head you know and and i had somebody wearing a little toboggan and i would get this query that would say why is he putting a sled on his head you know and things like that or uh double wide you know the copy editor i said she lived in a double wide the copy editor slash 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 double wide what you know, you never get that. And I, it's just kind of, it's helpful to have some, to have publish a publisher uh, that's speaking your language. It's helpful. Yeah, and I think it's the kind of thing that you don't, it doesn't dawn on you until you might not have it. You know, my, I've had the same editor. I've been really fortunate. And he's from Raleigh. We're working on our fourth book together and he's from Raleigh. So when I talk about a, a place in North Carolina, he knows what it looks like, what the weather's like. And so it, it is a, like a shorthand. That's a great way. Great way to put it. Um, so we have a question from Janet, Avid Bookshop down in Athens, Georgia. And Annette, I'll ask you this first. Um, Janet wants to know, did writing your book strengthen your relationship with your, with your region? Did it make you see it anew? Did it make you see it in a different way? How, how did it influence your backward looking experience of being from the place you call home? Yes, so um, because my book is, uh, his, is historical fiction, it required that I spend some time really trying to better understand how we got to 2020 from 1942 and what the threads are um, that, that hold these time periods together. Um, what were some of the events that happened when the book is set that might still be playing out today. And so that was a great experience. A lot of my research for the book, it was really looking at uh, photographs and what the landscape looked like. And so that, um, that has just been fascinating to me to think about how our landscape has and hasn't changed and why that might be. 
Um, obviously, I grew up in Cherokee, North Carolina, so I you know, have always been very connected to this community, but um, certainly got to know Asheville a little bit better um, and the crossover um, between both communities a little bit better in the process and of course you know when people know that you're writing a book especially historical fiction they like to tell you little stories about things that happened during that time so I always enjoy that part of the process. Well Heather I'll ask you you know I know that you said you had vacationed a lot out in Hatteras but I think you know spending a lot of time in a place is different than really getting in there and mining it when you write about it which you've done so you've done both. How did writing about it, you know, and I know you're close by in Raleigh, but how did writing about it maybe cause you to see it new for the first time? Yeah, definitely. I remember one time, like, yeah, we'd vacation there, like, I would vacation there. I fell in love with it. And um, for a long time, I wrote about it um, sort of from the point of view of an outsider, you know, stranger comes to town. And so, like, whole books about that, you know, raps, you know, rhapsodizing poetically about the scenery and, um, just like writing about it from from that point of view but then i remember one time i was down there just down there on a on a vacation and um we were driving up and down highway 12 which is just, if you're not super familiar with Hatteras Island, it's this one one little road that goes up and down this skinny little strip of island and if you want to go anywhere you got to go on highway 12 and it's gorgeous like you can see the water the sunsets it's magical it's beautiful but like it's that road like that is it you got to go up and down if you want to go anywhere and i remember just going up to the grocery store or something and wondering to myself for the first time, like, what would it be like to live here and have to, you know, drive up and down this road, you know, so many times a day, like, this is it. If you want to go anywhere, you got to go up and down the same road. Like, would it get old? Like, it eventually would the sort of the, like, the beauty of it fade into the background and it's just your everyday um, kind of grind of you have to go up Highway 12 again. Um, so that kind of sparked me thinking about what it would be right like to, um, right from the point of view of someone um, who lived there. And so I started just thinking more and more and more about that. And again, like, I think when you're vacationing there, you sort of just like, you're there to stay in your little beach house or your campground and go to the beach. But um, thinking about the community itself, the, the like the year round local community and how incredibly tight knit it is. And um, you now everybody knows everybody else. And I grew up in a small town in, in Southeastern Ohio. So I kind of familiar with that, but this takes it to the next level. Like this is a small town on an Island, like everybody knows everybody. And so I just started imagining, imagining it from that point of view and I actually wrote the book. So I was um, not living in North Carolina at the time, but um, sort of wrote it from that point of view before I had lived there. So I was just sort of like doing my best to, um, yeah, mine that territory from a different standpoint. And then um, when we actually did move there, um, after I got married, we moved down there and actually ended up moving into the, the inn, which I had um, wrote, written about, um, a fictionalized version of this inn, which is the setting of so much of my work there. <laughs> when we moved in there, my husband got a job as a chef yeah. there. And that's where we lived. And um, at that point, when I was living there, I sort of um, could see what I had gotten right and what I had gotten wrong about, um, you know, how I'd imagined it. And like, thankfully, I think I gotten most of it most of it all right, um, but it was definitely a, a shift to go from writing about it as a, a stranger to writing about it as um, imagining it as your hometown or having to, to grow up in that, in that world. Um, thank you. So what we, before we close out here, we got a few minutes left. Lee, would you kind of send us out with maybe a call to action if you're looking for a mentor or you know, with booksellers, or if you have an opportunity to be a mentor, what kind of advice would you give to people who find themselves in either one of those situations? Well, I think it's really important to be, to, today I hear a lot of things, like I got this call from this girl who said, well, she said, I'm, you know, she said, I'd like to talk, I'd like to meet for coffee and so on. She said, I'm a new author. And I said, oh, well, what have you written? And she said, well, I, I think they told me I had to establish my platform first. And I said, you're what? And she meant like her, like herself on all this, you know. And I said, honey, I don't think you want to write. If you're just going to do that, I said, you got to write, you know. And so I think you will run into people that have gotten some of this bad advice somewhere. And I don't know where about that they think they have to market themselves, you know, and they have to position their book and write about, you know, these things that are popular or they have to write genre fiction or whatever. There's a whole lot about marketing mm -hmm. that has 
influence as has come into writing. And I think it's just really important that that we all, you know, stick to the truths of the human heart, you know, and stick to what is important and what means something in this country at this time, you know, and stand up for all these things that have meant so much to us and what we believe in and what literature is supposed to, you know, is supposed to be about. Because uh, it can, you know, it, it is also really, really interesting. And there is no formula and there is no platform, you know. I think it's, it's important that, that, we, that we stick to, to what's important. That's a great way to end out. So thank you all, uh, Silas and Heather and Annette and Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank, thank you, you to Siba for bringing us all together virtually. I, I wish we were all in person. This is the second time I found myself telling Silas that on a Zoom call in, uh, in, in about a yeah. week. So um, thank you all for, for joining us today. And thank you to Siba for, for having us. This was a pleasure. And these are four, well, with Silas's seven fantastic books, six fantastic books. So please go out and, and purchase them from your local independently owned bookstore, especially here in the South. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to everybody.